So yeah, thank you, Andrew, for the basis of understanding. I think that's a brilliant foundation to, to build on now for some of the slightly more advanced stuff and also just my own view. Everyone's got a different view on the market based on the information they consume, the people they talk to, etc. So I might like certain sectors that An Andrew might like other sectors. So the backdrop for crypto, I'll go through this quickly. Andrew discussed most of the significant drivers crypto specifically, you've obviously got the ETF, you've got the halving, and then from my perspective, there's been very significant advancements on the actual technology since a few years ago. So we're very well set up. I'm not gonna go too deep on this, I could talk about this all day, but essentially the situation in, in Western countries like the UK, France, the US, is there's, there's a lack of willingness to solve the underlying problem. To expand GDP enough to keep tax rates the same there's no path to doing that. So essentially, there's two outcomes. You increase tax or you print more money to pay for the debt. This is the US debt. And both of those are good for crypto because increasing tax rates means that people want to take money offshore. Well, where do they take it? Dubai is an example. And part of why Dubai real estate has done so well, in my opinion, is because people are diversifying away from the West. Now, crypto is another option because crypto doesn't belong in any jurisdiction. It is a non-sovereign asset. That's what we refer it to. It's the same as gold, if you think about it. No one issues gold. No one owns gold. The Great British Pound belongs to Great Britain. The US dollar belongs to the United States. Same with the New York penthouse. It is, it is basically, it can be captured by the state. View, it is the perfect time for a non-sovereign currency like Bitcoin to really emerge and take center stage. And non-sovereign assets. We're seeing businesses being built within crypto which generate cash flow. There's a project called DYDX, and it pays me a 12% yield in, in dollars. I take the token, I stake it, it's a profitable company, and I just get paid USDC into my wallet on a daily basis. So we're starting to see profitable companies and real assets emerge. For the first time in the history of the industry, we're actually seeing profitable companies which exist in a non-sovereign, they're not, they're not an LLC in the, in, in the United States, they're not a limited company in the US. They're a protocol which lives on a blockchain and generates cash flow. Um, and yeah, these assets live on the internet. And we're well aware that the internet is the fastest growing economy known to mankind. So if you, YouTube being digital real estate is an example, this will be another example of, of that kind of mentality, that kind of idea. These are a couple of screenshots. So again, kind of a movement away from the West. Uh, People are looking for a solution to do commerce, not necessarily in dollars, but in other currencies. And this is kind of, you see Russia selling oil now to India and China. There's, there's different spheres of influence emerging in the world, and there's going to be increasing demand for a currency which doesn't belong to one jurisdiction. Liquidity. So this is, if you think very, very simply about this, when this is contracting, it's not good for, for asset prices, for real estate, for stocks, for crypto. And when it's expanding, it means there's just more dollars in existence. They're lowering interest rates or they're printing money. So naturally, assets go up. If you increase the, the amount of dollars in existence, well, naturally, the value of everything is going to increase, um, very simply. And this, this chart, I've screenshotted it from one of YouTube videos because I couldn't find it this morning. But this is the, the amount of stable coins. You will have heard of USDC or USDT, probably. And stop me at any point if anyone has a question or I'm going too quickly. Just stop me and ask me a question. So this is increasing. And this is we want to see this because it means that there's inflows into crypto. If you take a, a dollar in a bank account and you wire it to Binance and you buy crypto, a stable coin has to be created for you to do that. So if this chart is going up, it means that there's an increase of liquidity. There's inflows into crypto. And you see where this bottomed. This bottomed at the beginning of October. And if you look at crypto prices, this was literally the bottom of, of crypto. That's exactly where we started uptrending. So you need to be watching stablecoin liquidity. And it also very, very closely marked the top. If you would have sold right around here, you would have captured most of the bull market gains. It's not something which people look at enough. Have you correlated that to the Fury Index? No, I haven't, no. Statistical work doesn't do too well on longer time frames because we don't have enough price history. The asset class has only been around since 2009. So you can do some statistical analysis on shorter time frames, like day to day, week to week, but over years, it's, it's, it's harder because it could be a spurious correlation. So you do need to mix some discretion. Yeah, I imagine that they probably follow 
Yeah. I would imagine they would, yeah, yeah, most likely, based on what we know about history, yeah. Um, technological drivers, a few things here. We know that people get transactions blocked all the time. Someone was telling me I thought... Yeah, so imagine you would have just sent that using crypto. Obviously, no one is stopping you from accessing your money. You've got access to it whenever you want, and you send it, and it arrives instantly. Also, information censorship. So we've seen what's happened. People have been deplatformed a significant amount on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And part of the reason why that can happen is because the back end to where that content is posted is owned by a company. Imagine if that back end was not owned by any one person or controlled by any one person. Well, you literally couldn't deplatform someone because that content would continue to exist if it was to be posted on a public blockchain. Andrew spoke a little bit about AI. I believe there's significant confluence between crypto and AI. Reasons why that makes sense, which I don't have time to go into today. I made a YouTube video about it if you want to watch that. Um, and then, yeah, significant improvements in the underlying technology, as I said before, whereby it's becoming a real idea that people can actually do business using this technology. Previous to this cycle, I would argue it was predominantly speculation apart from Bitcoin, and now we're seeing real use cases emerge for, for public blockchains, which is very exciting. Um, so in terms of myself, which sectors do I like? Obviously, Andrew spoke about gaming, gambling, and AI, which are all solid. I would have put gaming on here. I would have put gambling on here if I would have had space. I like things which are trying to kill Ethereum because I'm more involved. I'm able to look for the things which can displace leaders. Bitcoin can't be displaced. It has a brand, an incredibly strong brand. Ethereum has a brand, but it's open to being disrupted because Ethereum is a play on technology. Bitcoin is a play on money. So when you're a play on technology, you expose yourself to better technology disrupting you. So I'm interested in the things which can potentially disrupt Ethereum. Ethereum is a roughly $300 billion asset. So yeah, could you make 10x your money on it? Yes, you probably could if it's successful. But you could also choose something which is up and coming, which has very, very strong tech, which even the idea of market participants beginning to think this could disrupt Ethereum, the asset's going to mark up significantly more. So there's two approaches which, which people, which projects are taking to displacing Ethereum. You've got a modular approach and a monolithic approach. Don't worry about what these words mean at this point in time but they are two different technical approaches to doing what Ethereum does. And specifically here, if you are looking for a slightly de-risked play, which could have very, very good upside if Ethereum is to be displaced, I think the fastest horse here could be Sol and the least risky. You look at some of the other coins, you'd have to monitor what's going on with them more closely. Um, Monad is a coin which is going to be launching later this year, which I'm extremely positive on. I've spoken to the team, I know the team, and there's gonna be a significant amount of hype around a monad when it launches. The same goes for Eigenlayer. Eigenlayer is an airdrop that I am farming currently, which I'll speak about in, the, in, in a few of these slides. But Eigenlayer, again, when it launches, will be extremely, extremely hyped up. And you've got a few other coins there, which, again, if the idea that Ethereum can be become disrupted becomes increasingly accepted, all of these coins can do extremely well. Take, for example, Dimension trades at a $3 billion market cap. So imagine even if people start thinking, mm, could Dimension displace Ethereum? I mean, the room for upside is significant because of the amount of value that Ethereum has that something which can disrupt it can, can do extremely well. And then you've got a different sector, decentralized physical infrastructure, which I like. You've got a project called Helium. So they've actually launched a, a mobile plan in the US. They, they are incentivizing people with crypto tokens to set up little telecoms radars all around the country. So they're giving them tokens, and they've actually been able to build out a network big enough that they've launched a 5G plan, um, which is extremely impressive and interesting token. And then crypto and AI, these are the different tokens that I am, I am looking at. You've got ones which are trying to decentralize compute. And then you've got some AI models and agents. And then you've also got storage. Um, all interesting coins in their own right. And I think AI as a sector 
within crypto can do extremely well. M myself, out of this list, I'm focused on Celestia, which is TIA, Eigenlayer, Solana, Monad, and essentially the whole AI sector. You could hold a basket of these, and even if one or two of them were to go to zero, it's my belief that as a sector, it would perform extremely well. There are some people I know who literally their entire portfolio is just AI because they have that much conviction that the, the confluence of having had chat GPT pop off and now we're expecting a crypto bull run that they're willing to take that risk and allocate essentially their entire portfolio into AI. And these are not idiots. These are people managing portfolios far larger than mine. And yeah, so late last year, I was able to make $112 in a day. So in September, I just bought Solana. Solana at that point was, was $25. And essentially, I was thinking, okay, I bought this asset, so is there anything that I can do with it? Can I make it productive? And I'd heard of a project called Gito, very solid project. I'd heard the team were good, et cetera and they hadn't yet released the token. So the key there was that I'd, I knew that there was a good project which had not yet released the token. And so I said, well, I'll use my SOL and I'll stake it into their project. So I'll, I'll take my Solana and I'll put it with them. And sure enough, in early December, they, they released a token which I was able to claim and sell for 112,000 in that one day. And the nicest part was, in the meantime, while I was waiting to receive the airdrop, Solana went from 25 to 140 dollars. So I actually made more money on, on the Solana trade than, than, than the airdrop. But people, people were able to put just one Solana into Gito and make 15 grand. And what's the Solana now it's about 100. Shit. When I $100. bought it, yeah. When I bought it, it was 20, 25. Yeah. If you allocated that towards this particular effort. This particular strategy where, yeah, there were some people who put in $20, they bought one SOL, one token, they staked it with GITO, and they made, yeah, $15,000 from this airdrop. Because there were so few people doing it. There was less than 10,000 people who did this, and there was 165 million distributed to those people. So you can imagine the amount that each person was able to make was extremely significant. Now, this is an outstanding one, but I have made, reg I regularly receive airdrops worth one, three, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 quite regularly. And some of the larger ones have been in the $20,000 $20, range. Now, naturally, as more people hear about this, it can become diluted, but it, I believe that we've probably still got six to 12 months of, of ridiculous opportunities with, with some of this airdrop farming stuff, because it's not something which, I mean, who, who in this room had heard of airdrop farming before I spoke about it? Four. And you're all people who are online, you're speaking about money, you're talking to people who are relatively plugged in. So if you imagine the average person would probably have, 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 have no idea. They're just doing airdrops for fucking iPads. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. That's a good kind of secret. Do you want to clarify like airdropping? And like what? That's what I'm going to do now. So I first wanted to give you the example, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to, to kind of... So an airdrop is essentially, imagine Facebook back in the day in 2012 or whatever, when they would have initially come out. In order to incentivize, in order to get users from another social media, imagine if they would have said, we're going to give you all a tiny piece of Facebook stock just to use the product, just to post photos. We're going to give you 0.1%. We're going to give you all 0.1%. Imagine how much that Facebook will be worth today on the basis that the project is successful or the company is successful. Now, clearly, you can sell it when you get the tokens and you can realize a gain or you can hold it. If it was Facebook, you, you know, you'd probably make an outrageous amount of money from holding it. But the, the idea is just that. It's using tokens to incentivize usage of an application or an entire blockchain. So in the case of Gito, it was a project which was based on Solana. Solana is a blockchain and then there's applications which can build on top of Solana. So Gito was an application. So it's, it can be either an application or a blockchain when it's at an early stage because they want users in order to test it in the same way that if you launched a piece of software, you'd want people to use it so you know that it works or they can find bugs in it or they can tell you, oh, I don't like this, I want this instead. 
So they want people to use it, so they incentivize people to use it with monetary rewards in the form of, of airdrops. So then airdrop farming is clearly just trying to maximize the value of each one of these opportunities. So for example, I know some people who did Gito with 100 wallets, and there was one kid who made, I think, three to four million dollars from, from this one, from this one because he'd done it on multiple different wallets. So each wallet received the airdrop, and then he's gone in and, and, and sold it for so USDC. Was there a certain amount you could only use, certain amount you could allocate to one wallet? No, they did it in, in tiers. So it was the amount, of, the amount of Solana that you had staked with Gito. That was, what, that was what put you into tiers. They put it into tiers, basically. So like a wallet that had staked one Solana gets X amount, a wallet that had staked 10 gets more, 100 gets more, 1,000 gets more. And, and so what's the difference between staking on multiple wallets and just putting more on one wallet? Because that, if you imagine that being a chart of like one gets X amount of tokens, 10 gets more, yeah. and, you, and you imagine that on like a chart yeah. of like, okay, so if it's, if it's how many tokens you get on, on, on the y-axis, and it's, and it's how much Solana you've staked on the bottom, it might not be linear. But so it might not be a linear relationship. So you put in a thousand, but you'd be better off putting one in, in a thousand dollars. Exactly, exactly. Because the, the, they naturally don't necessarily want to benefit the richest users. So if someone put, let's say, fuck it, I'm going to do one wallet, I'm going to put 10 million in, they would have been better splitting that 10 million up into multiple different wallets because they don't really want people to do this. They want real users. They want it to be literally one guy who says, oh, I'm interested in using this. I'm going to do it. But the more you offer for the one, the more users you get. Yeah, but naturally, just because of the fact that it's a market and people are going to exploit certain things, you do get people doing farming these things, right? So there's, yeah. there's people who have software which will create wallets for them, it will send tokens into these different wallets. People have got crazy operations set up, but you don't need to necessarily have those operations set up to, to do that. I had two wallets. It seems so far, so I did this in, in December with the, well, one of the guys I work with, and at that point we had no idea that this was gonna play out. We had an idea that it would because of some people that we'd spoken to, but we didn't know that it was going to begin playing out so early. So we saw an airdrop to Celestia Stakers. So as you can see, this is the kind of language that they'll use. So we're building on top of Celestia. We're using Celestia in the same way that some of you might use, in order to build your business, you'll use a software tool. You might use, I don't know, Zapier, for example. And then in the crypto world, if you use someone's project, Generally, they'll try and connect themselves to you in some way or incentivize you to use them. So incentivize you to use Zapier and you'll get Zapier tokens in this example. So as you can see, people who stake tier in Celestia as of December 19 are eligible for 2% of the total supply of DYM. And the minimum stake was one TIA, which at the time would have been worth about $10. And I think that will be about $1,000 per wallet. So there's multiple opportunities like this. With, with Ethereum, I'm staking in, in Eigenlayer, which is a project that I spoke about earlier, which will be extremely hyped up, probably have a market cap of between 10 to 20 billion at launch, is what we expect. So often it can be as simple as, look, I don't want to get into all the complicated shit. I don't have time. You're all running businesses. You're making money on a monthly basis. You don't necessarily need this cash, you'd rather spend your time working on your own businesses, well then it can be as simple as, look, I, I like Solana, I'm already owning it, well what can I do with it? What can I do with it to improve the potential return that I can make on it? So for example, with Ethereum, it will naturally be a large part of people's investment portfolios because it's one of the biggest assets. Okay, then is there anything that I can actually do with it? Can I make it productive? Well, yes, you can go and, and put it in Eigenlayer and you'll receive essentially an additional return for taking similar risks. And there are, there, are, there are some additional risks to consider, but on the basis it's a trusted project, 
generally speaking, you are adding return for the same level of, of risk that you're taking. Um, yeah. Solana-based airdrops, which have not yet airdropped, you've got all of, these, all of these projects where using them in whatever way, shape, or form. So, Andrew, coming back to what you said, for example, so MarginFi is a, essentially like a crypto bank. You can, deposit, you can deposit assets on one side and you can borrow against them. So let's say you had invested in Bitcoin and you didn't want to sell it, but you wanted to get some cash against it. Exactly the same as a home equity loan, which you have in, in the US. You have the house, you borrow cash against it because you want to use that cash. So in the exact same situation with MarginFi, you might have your Bitcoin, put it on there, and you borrow dollars against it, and you do something with those dollars, be it spend it, or earn yield on it elsewhere. So, so yeah, I think that's all that I had. This is a few general thoughts. Use a hardware wallet, as, as Andrew said. Secure yourself properly. You don't want to be having all of your money on an exchange for the exact reason that FTX blew up. People who had all their money on there got wiped. Don't get shaken out by the volatility. This asset class moves a ridiculous amount. It can whip like you've never believed. I remember May, May 19, 2022, Bitcoin and Ethereum were down 40% in one day. So I was sitting there, 40% down. And we're talking about quite large amounts of money. So if you don't do your homework and have an idea of what you own, of what you own, you will sell on those days because the emotions will come out and you'll think, whoa, 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 whoa. I've just put 100 grand and it's 60. I'm going to sell it. And you'll be selling to people who have done their homework, who are willing to step in on those days. So if you've got to know what you own, at least to some extent, you've got to have an idea, this token that I own, what does it do? What are my expectations for it? Because if you don't, you will become a bitch to the volatility. The volatility will own you. And it has to be the other way around. You need to Use the volatility to, to your advantage. When price is down a lot, that's when you buy. When price is up a lot, that's when you sell. Don't be victim to, to your emotions. And the key there is doing your homework. I see no other way to, to use the volatility to your, to your advantage. Generally speaking, don't try and be a trader. The lifestyle is not a lifestyle you particularly want. It's at the screen 18 hours a day. It's going to sleep with stress because... You're holding something that you don't particularly want to own long term. For 99% of people, you're better off buying and holding or buying and selling when certain goals are met. And the second one is actually extremely valuable. I put 100 grand in. When it gets to 300, I'm going to sell it because then I've reached my goal to do whatever I want to do with that money. And that, that's a good one. That's one that people don't necessarily adhere to enough because when it goes up, then they expand their goals. And then it goes up more and they expand their goals more. And that's how you get caught holding onto things as they go down 75% in the bear market. And the final one, this applies to any investment or any trade, in my opinion, and it is to, to manage your expectations. Crypto could easily go sideways or down in the next three months. Easily. I would not be surprised. Equally, I wouldn't be surprised if it went up. So just think longer term is generally useful and think in probabilities. Nothing is certain. Nothing at all is certain. I believe it is probable that crypto is going to do well. That's what I tell people. I don't say crypto is going to do well this year. I say, based on everything I know, all of the things are lining up, based on the technology, based on some of the geopolitics and, and the economics. You've got Trump election as well later this year. It will be good for crypto if he wins. Uh, and crypto-specific drivers. Based on all of this, I believe there's a high probability that it's going to go up. I don't know whether, what, what the fuck it's going to do tomorrow or tonight. No idea. I'd be lying if I said I, I knew what was going to happen. So, so, yeah, manage your expectations and, and thinking probabilities. And that, that's more or less it. Um, yeah, any questions, happy to, to take them. <laughs>